everybody. Welcome to Sap Valley Online. It is so great to be together. And as you are in your homes worshiping the Lord, we want to welcome you here this morning. If you're from Sap Valley, Lamore, welcome. If you're all the way in Porterville at Sap Valley, Porterville, we welcome you as well as we worship together from where we are. If you're with us for the first time, raise your voices. Allow God to move in your home as we sing praise. Come on.
affection I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken sing I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in Father, Lord, as we gather in homes across this community, in homes even across the world, Lord, pray that your way would just penetrate every home, that your voice would speak to hearts, Lord, that you would work in a way that would allow your heart to be our heart, Lord, that you would work in great and mighty ways that you would just draw people to you, Lord. And it would be an opportunity to be in your presence and just take you in and allow you to move, Lord. So as we seek you this morning, we give you all the praise for the great God that you are. In your name we pray, amen. Well, folks, for those of you who are tuning in and don't know the story of SVCC, we're actually in a time of transition where we're searching for a new senior pastor. I am the acting executive pastor, but I'm only here until the next senior pastor is found. And there's a team called the Pastoral Search Team that have been working together over many weeks and months, praying and doing some of the, of the preliminary work to get ready to begin to interview candidates and look forward to calling a new senior pastor. And I've been delighted to listen into some of their meetings and see the hard work and the diligence and the godliness in which they're doing this process as they seek Christ for wisdom and guidance to find the right candidate. And so, this morning, Thomas Curtis, who is the chairperson of the pastoral search team, we invited him to come and just give a little update to the church, to where we're at in the process, and to encourage you to pray. So, Thomas, uh, share. Share a little bit of an, of, an, of an update with the congregation. All right, great. Thank you, Gilbert. Hey, good morning, South Valley. Again, my name is Thomas Curtis, and I'm the, the chair of our pastoral search team. I'm uh, just going to spend a few moments just giving you a quick update. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for your prayers, and thank you for your patience. Uh, this, we've seen over the last few months that this is absolutely a process that we don't want to rush, and all of our group is taking everything very seriously. So, right now we are meeting weekly. It looks a little bit different because of COVID. We are meeting via Zoom, but we still are meeting weekly. And with that being said, we are pushing forward. And right now in the process, uh, we, there is an end in sight with the documents that we have been working on for the past few months. And those two documents, one is showing who we are as a church uh, to South Valley to present to our pastoral candidates. And the second one is what we are looking for as a senior pastor here at South Valley. And so that is exciting news. We spent countless hours of prayer uh, in there. Uh, and, and through the process, and with that end in sight, next step after that is inter the interview process. So in the near future, um, we're going to start via Zoom, uh, the interview process in the near future, and then uh, going on from there. And you can imagine um, that is exciting, and it is very, uh, there, there's a lot compacted into that. So we would really appreciate your continued prayer and your continued patience as we further along in the process. Hey, good morning, South Valley. I read a tweet just during the week there. It said words like this here, when I get uncertain about the future, I get scared, and then I blame, and then I resent. Alternatively, I can admit that any certainty about life was a myth long before COVID, confessing that Jesus alone is our certainty. And it just resonated with me because I always thought maybe I was in control of my future. And really, I'm just realizing more and more I never was in control of my future. It's just certainly more driving into me that reality. But welcome to our fifth or sixth service online. And I don't know how many more weeks online, 
but we're delighted that you're here, and we're trying our best to keep you engaged with us and keep bringing things online for you to participate in the life of faith, exploring faith, or growing in your faith. So, make sure that you're checking out our website, make sure you're checking out our Facebook, and go to our YouTube account. And on that YouTube account, SVCC Lamore, you'll see all the channels that we have, which includes really fun things that are happening with our children's ministry. And hey, whether you're a little kid or you're a big kid, you can look out some of those videos and join in some of the fun things they're doing, as well as some of the teaching things that they're doing. So, we'll do what we can to keep those things coming, and you know what's happening on Tuesday evening with worship, Thursday morning with worship, Thursday evening Bible study, and then Sunday morning. What a great opportunity for you to invite a friend or a colleague or a neighbor to listen in to a message of hope, a message of life. And you can just send them the link to our YouTube channel or to our Facebook and say, hey, why don't you listen in one Sunday or one hour during the week to participate in the worship of SVCC? So we're delighted that you're watching us this morning, and we're delighted for your ongoing faithful giving. And although the church is closed as a building, we're still functioning in ministries, we're still functioning as a body of believers, and your tithe and your giving is so vital to us. So, we're very appreciative for your generosity in, in, the, in the past, and we know that you're going to continue it through this time of doing church a little bit different, but uh, we're thankful for your giving and for your faithfulness in that. And then, this Sunday, Pastor Frank is doing the teaching, and I was meant to be in Salinas, I think it was meant to be at, and Frank was scheduled to preach, and so, hey, let's just have Frank preach this Sunday. And then I come back after this Sunday, and I think I've got like five weeks in a row where we're going to unpack the book of Leviticus, <laughs> and I don't know why. I think it's because of quarantine and COVID, okay? I'm just stir-crazy, and I need to give myself a challenge to preach from a difficult book. So, we're putting together some messages on the book of Leviticus, but we're delighted that Pastor Frank is here today, and so listen in as Pastor Frank leads us in teaching this morning. Hello, South Valley. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to today's service, and even to those of you who aren't part of South Valley Community Church's family, you're part of our family as you're around the world, perhaps tuning in and in a different place. Before we begin into God's Word this morning, uh, something that I want you to join me in prayer with today. On April 13th, our mayor, Edward Neal, lost his wife, Maisha, to cancer. And it's kind of a rippling effect through our community, well-loved family. And before we get into God's Word, let's just take a moment uh, and lift that precious family up to the Lord. Father in heaven, you are king of all kings. You rule and reign with supreme authority. You know everything. We inform you of nothing. And you know, Lord, of the Neal family and the pain that's there right now, the, the loss. And you're near to them. They know you. And we thank you for Aisha, for her life of faith. But we lift up our mayor, Edward, and pray for strength for their family. Lord, give them strength as they walk through this very difficult day. And Father, again, we want to remember the other churches in our community, Grace Baptist and the Nazarene Church and Quantania Fellowship and Father, so many others that are meeting online for their services today. We pray, Lord, you would bless those congregations, though they're not together physically, that they would be together, uh, Lord, in their worship. Bless our time together. Open our hearts. Give us understanding. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you will get your Bible and open it to Mark chapter 14, I want to bring a message this morning that I've entitled The Fragrance of of extravagant love. Mark chapter 14. When the unbelieving world examines the Christian, 
they often have a difficult time figuring us out. It, I mean, in terms of their own worldview, their philosophy is basically one of selfishness and getting, while the Christian philosophy is one of selflessness and giving. And let's face it, rarely, if ever, does Hollywood ever portray a genuine Christian in a positive way. More often than not, uh, Christianity is lampooned and we're made to come off as weird or eccentric. And folks, it's always been that way. God-centered people in a man-centered world are indeed a mystery, an enigma, something difficult to understand. I mean, they look at us and they go, why would a people who are already engaged with the busyness of life take additional time to render service to God? Why would they tithe their income when they're already taxed enough? Why would they choose to deny themselves any pleasure at all when life is so short? I mean, these things don't make a lot of sense to those who don't know Christ. When people in the world see Christians in the midst of a, a horribly trying circumstance and they refuse to be devastated by it, but rather they, they turn to God in faith and even when they don't understand, it baffles some people when from their perspectives Christians should be cursing God and yet are praising Him. The world doesn't understand how to, how to file that. Uh, when Christians kind of take it on the chin and re respond in love, the world kind of scratches its head in amazement and goes, what, what's the matter with them? What kind of people are these? What, what motivates them to want to live that way? What is it about them that causes them to live that kind of a life? Well, a simple, a simple answer to that question would be very similar to something the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. He said that it is the love of Christ that compels us. We have come into a relationship with the living God He's loved us, He's reached out to us, He's forgave us, and now He walks with us through even the hardest times of life. He has given meaning and purpose to our lives. And all we have, folks, we owe to Him. We owe it all to Him. Nothing we could ever do would be enough to repay Jesus for all that He's done for us. He lives in us. He empowers us by His Spirit to face life and to face the, the difficulties that it brings from an entirely different point of view. We have a whole different perspective. And our love for Him causes us then to live for Him. Love for Jesus is the motivating force, isn't it? And the longer we know Him, the more we love Him. There's nothing too great to do for our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing too much that we can give. In Mark 14, it tells the story of a woman's love for her Lord. Now, Mark does not mention her name, as we'll look at the text here in just a moment. He just refers to her as a woman, but if you go over to the Gospel of John, John uh, tells us that the woman was in fact Mary from the town of Bethany, who we know as the sister of Martha and Lazarus, that man that Jesus raised from the dead. Now if you have your Bible, the scene unfolds just days before the Passover and the crucifixion of our Lord. Verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this 
fragrant oil wasted, for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do good to them, but me you do not have always. Now she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. What an incredible scene. I want us to first of all consider Mary's love. Very simple outline today. First of all, Mary's love. Those who are in love with Jesus are overflowing with gratitude to Him. Sometimes they do strange things that indicate their love for Him. At least outwardly they appear strange. Now Mary loved the Lord. Jesus had been a real friend to her. He had filled her life with hope. He had been there during some of the most difficult times of her life. Certainly one of those difficult times was when her brother Lazarus had died. And Jesus shows up on the scene four days after they buried him and raises him miraculously back to life. But Mary had experienced the wonderful love that Jesus had for her. He was not like any other man she had ever known. He was a powerful man. He could speak and cause the storms to cease, the demons to flee, the dead to be raised. Little children, far from being afraid of him, ran to his arms. He was wise and he was always pointing people to God. And he had reached out to her and how could she ever thank him? Well, one evening... She found herself in the home of somebody she undoubtedly knew well. They were from Bethany. It's a village, not a town. And she's in this home with a number of others, and they're having this meal together. And she no doubt thought, this may be the last chance I have to really show Jesus how much I love Him and am devoted to Him. And so she sees this opportunity and she took this alabaster flask, this vial of oil, very costly perfume, and she broke it and she began to pour it on him. We learn from the text that the perfume was worth over 300 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage in that day. In other words, this was worth over a year's wages. You talk about extravagance. Why would she do such a thing? Well, this was like Mary. Mary had an attitude of devotion to Jesus, and this is not the first time we've seen it displayed. You could go back in the Gospels a ways, and you would find her in another setting, sitting at the feet of Jesus. All of the while, her sister Martha is scurrying about, preparing a meal, serving everybody there. And Martha finally gets a little frustrated with her sister and says, Lord, tell her to help me. And Jesus actually commended her for being the one who stood there and hung on every word he was teaching. Mary's devotion is a lesson to us, folks. The mark of a true believer is that he or she is someone who genuinely is in love with Jesus. Mary's love moved her. She held nothing sacred, held nothing too precious to give to Him, and what she gave was worth more than a year's wages. Consider how much that is. To really get a feel for it, you just kind of need to calculate that and translate that into today's economy. Consider for a moment how much you make in a year. What's your gross salary and, and benefits? What is the total package for an entire year? Now add approximately three more months to that because what she offered was worth over 300 days work. There are only 260 weekdays in an average year and that includes time we take off for vacation. Now get that figure in your head for a minute. And when you do, you will have the figure of what she gave. 
over a year, if, if you gave over a year of your income to the Lord, that's what she did. That's a lot. That's what we would call extravagant. And no doubt what she gave cost her. Now, there's no indication that Mary, Martha, or Lazarus was wealthy. The very fact that they lived in this little village probably indicates that they weren't uh, that wealthy. But what she gave cost her. Just like if you gave a year's wages, it would cost you. But folks, that is the mark of genuine love. That is the mark of Christian giving. If our giving never costs us, then our giving never really means anything. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, King David wanted to make a sacrifice to God, and he approached a man by the name of Aruna, who was a Jebusite. And David approached him about buying his threshing floor. And David said, I would like to purchase that. I want to build an altar and make a sacrifice to God. Well, Aruna, he, he was loyal to his king. And, and he, what he wanted to do is he said, look, I'll, just, I'll give you the threshing floor. I'll give you the, the wood. I'll even give you the oxen for the sacrifice. But David would not accept it. He told Aruna that he wanted to buy it for a price. And he said this, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. You see, David recognized, as should we, that for an offering to be meaningful, it must cost us something. But even though it cost Mary a great deal, she rejoiced in the fact that she had been given the wonderful privilege to pour it out on her Lord. It wasn't a burdensome gift. It wasn't metered out. It was a gift of love, and it was a gift which was an example of the fragrance of genuine love for her Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't know for certain what was in Mary's mind as she worshipped the, the Lord with her aromatic treasure, but the Lord gave a profound theological purpose for it. And in coming to her defense, Jesus praised her devotion as a good deed, and He used the occasion to signal the coming of His own death. And if you'll read through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus often spoke about His impending death in Jerusalem. It was almost like Mary had some insight into what Jesus had been saying all along. And she said, it's now or never. I'm going to pour this out as an offering to the one I love so much. You see, the first step in preparing a body for burial was to rinse it in water and then anoint it with a perfumed oil. And Jesus said, she has done this in advance. Philip Keller wrote a book called Rabboni. And he describes the effect of Mary's worship. Listen to what he writes. The delicious fragrance ran down over his shining hair and thick beard. It enfolded his body with its delightful aroma. Even his tunic and flowing undergarment were drenched with its enduring pungency. Wherever he moved during the ensuing 48 hours, the perfume would go with him into the Passover, into the Garden of Gethsemane, into the high priest's home, into Herod's hall, into Pilate's praetorium, into the crude hands of those who cast lots for his clothing at the foot of the cross. Jesus would go into his ordeal already prepared for the grave. Mary's act of love sent a fragrance of her devotion to Jesus. But her act of love was immediately followed by man's logic. Point number two, man's logic. What Mary did did not make sense, especially to the calculating logical mind. And immediately, the nitpickers and the complainers began to talk. From John's Gospel... We see that Judas is actually the one that made the loudest complaint. By the way, you can thank John <laughs> for being the guy who tells us who people are. In, in Matthew's gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Matthew says, and someone drew a sword and, and, and took off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Matthew doesn't tell us who it was, but if you go over to John, John says, oh, that was Peter. 
When Mark includes this account of Mary, Mark doesn't tell us. He just says it was a woman. But you go over to the Gospel of John, and John says, I don't mind telling you who it was. It was Mary. And, and, and then here, we don't know. It just says, and they began to complain and criticize her. But if you go over to the Gospel of John, John says, let me tell you who it was. The main person criticizing her was Judas. You see, Judas was the treasurer of the group. John tells us that he was the one who kept the bag of money. And he simply could not stand what was happening. All he saw was that costly ointment worth over a year's wages had been poured out and absolutely wasted. And immediately as he watched her glug, glug, glug that beautiful fragrant oil all over Jesus, he began to calculate just how much was being wasted and what it could have been sold for. And then he offered this logical complaint. Verse 4, there were some, Judas primarily, who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 an hour and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. Now remember, Judas's motives were anything but pure. Something about this evening brought this false disciple to his end. I was going to say to the end of his rope, but that would be a terrible pun because later on he will hang himself. I would never use a terrible pun in a message. You know me better than that. But this brings him to the end. It may have been the public rebuke. As he began to sharply criticize her, he gets rebuked right in front of everybody. That's always fun. Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? She has done a good work for me. That had to have stung. But perhaps it was even more than that. Perhaps it was the Lord's attitude towards the woman's waste. Why, why is he condoning this? And it must have triggered his betrayal. You, see, you think about this. He, he had heard his Messiah, the man he believed was the Messiah, he had heard Jesus time and again predict his own demise. He's heard it one too many times, and now he's heard it again, or he's about to. Like, like most Jews, he longed for a military political king who would stand up against Rome's authority and restore Israel's uh, prominence. But Jesus never spoke of conquest. He kept talking about dying. John tells us the man was a thief. He complained about it because he was a thief who pilfered out of the money bag which was in his care. That's what John says. So perhaps his real motivation was to sell the perfume so the money could kind of go into his bag. We really don't know. But in spite of all of that, his complaint centered, and we're going to have to be fair, it's centered around a very logical argument. He, he complained that what Mary had done was a waste. He said the perfume ought to have been sold and the money given to the poor. Now that sounds not only like a logical argument, but a very benevolent and worthwhile argument as well. However, while it might look like that on the outside, Jesus didn't buy it at all. It's not that Jesus doesn't care for the poor. Of course he cares for the poor. But he saw more than Judas saw. Jesus saw that Mary had seized an opportunity to express her love for him. And folks, all of the logic in the world could not take that away from her. Jesus reminded them, look, the, the poor would always be with you. And anytime you have an opportunity to do something for the poor, if that's what you want to do, then yeah, absolutely do that. But Mary had chosen to do the best thing she could. She had seized an opportunity to offer what she could to Jesus. Judas didn't understand. He did not understand, folks, because he was outside of Christ in his devotion. Judas lacked a living relationship with Jesus Christ. His relationship was based only on the, the intellectual reasons. He thought Christ may be the Messiah, yes, and if Christ were the Messiah, he wanted to be on the inside track so he could, as it were, ride his coattails to the top. He was ambitious, but his commitment to Jesus was an intellectual one. And folks, an intellectual commitment to Jesus is never enough. Intellectual commitment lasts only as long 
as things go the way you think they should go. And when they stop going the way you think they should go, you'll get out. And that was certainly true in Judas's case. When things started to go a different direction, the one Judas wanted, Judas betrayed the Lord. Intellectual commitment is never enough. So we see Mary's love and we see man's logic, but let's bring it home and learn the Lord's lesson. Thirdly, the Lord's lesson. In the midst of the complainers, Jesus gives us an exhortation. He gives us the answer for the question, what determines a true good work? Verse 6, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. What Jesus is saying is that motives are what really count. Why did Mary do this good work? She did it because she loved Jesus. She offered that very costly perfume, folks, out of a heart motivated by love. Her motives were right. And Jesus saw that. He looks not merely on the outward work, but He looks at the motives of the heart. And if our motives are right, that's what really counts. For Christian service to really count, folks, it must be done unto the Lord. Christian service that is not done because of our love for Jesus is not true Christian service. But service offered, I love this, even imperfect service will always be accepted if we do it because we love Jesus. Notice what else Jesus said. Verse 8, she has done what she could. Think about this. It's not what you can't do, but it's what you can do that matters. It's been said that the good is the worst enemy of the best. Too often, people get hung up because there is so much good that needs to be done. There are a multitude of worthy causes. There are so many great needs and so few resources to go around. And when we look at all of the good that could be done, some people get derailed from doing what can be done. You might not be able to feed all of the world's hungry, but you can feed one or two, one or two families. You might not be able to comfort all of the lonely people, but you can comfort one or two. You can text or call one or two. You may not be able to do everything, but you are able to do something, right? Jesus said she has done what she could. And what you can do, you ought to do. Be careful not to be derailed from doing what you can do because of the things you cannot do. There are many good things, but the best thing is the thing God is calling you to do now. In Mary's case, the good thing was selling the ointment and giving the money to the poor. The best thing was to use it to truly worship Jesus by anointing Him. She did what she could. She did the best thing. The question put to us then is, is one of what can we do? What is God calling us to do? When Mary expressed her love for Jesus in that extravagant way, here's what John tells us. John tells us that the entire house was filled with the sweet-smelling fragrance of that perfume. John chapter 12, verse 3. What Mary did was a beautiful thing. It was true worship. And it was, her ex and it was an example of her genuine love for Jesus Christ. Think about this, folks. It doesn't make a lot of sense to the world when we express that kind of devotion to Jesus. To those of us who love Jesus, though, this makes sense. We understand Mary, don't we? We understand that moment when she said, it's all for Him. Every drop is for my Lord. You see, we know that when we truly give ourselves in worship to Him, our lives are filled with a sweet-smelling fragrance of His wonderful love. God is calling all of us to give ourselves to Him. Somebody once wrote this, the challenge for the Christian 
is not to be willing to die for Jesus, but to be willing to live for Jesus. It takes greater commitment to be willing to live for Him than to be willing to die for Him. But that is where commitment really counts, isn't it? That's where real commitment counts for the sake of the kingdom of God. It is living for Jesus and the living of Him through us that we really accomplish kingdom work. The question of living for Jesus revolves around the simple question, what can I do? What can I do? God has gifted each one of us. He's given everyone different abilities. What do you have? Don't focus on what you don't have. What do you have? What can you do well? All of us can do something. None of us are without some ability, some measure of talent. Our gifts may not be great, but they are ours. So can I just conclude by saying this? Respond to Him today by offering yourself first as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. Place yourself in the offering that is taken to Him. Then offer those gifts of what you can do in the service of His kingdom. And as you do, you're going to find that He will not only accept them, He'll rejoice over them. From your life will come, folks, a sweet aroma a genuine fragrance of love for your Lord. Into your life will come the joy that belongs to those who are in His service and in His will. So before we close this morning, ask yourself this. What can I do? Yeah, we're not meeting together physically anymore. But let me remind you of something that happened. Early in the church, the Christians experienced the day of Pentecost together. And it says that they were all together and thousands were being saved and thousands more were coming to Christ. And then there arose this great persecution, Acts tells us. And the, and the disciples at that point were scattered. They went into North Africa. They went into Asia Minor. They went into, into Europe. They went south through Samaria. Social distancing. <laughs> And that's where the gospel began to turn the world upside down. What's happening today, in our world today, it is not a hindrance to the kingdom of God. It's for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. There's something you can do from where you're sitting today. You can pick up a phone. You can write a letter. You can talk to a neighbor from their front yard through their front door. You can make those contacts without getting too close. There's, we're, listen, we're only limited by our imagination of how we can impact our world. You can go to the store for somebody. You can do something. So do something. Give it to Jesus. May the Lord bless you. Have a good and godly week. Bye for now.